Mr. Crimsworth, having removed his Macintosh, sat down by the fire. I remained standing near the hearth. He said presently, Staten, you may leave the room. I have some business to transact with this gentleman. Come back when you hear the bell. The individual at the desk rose and departed, closing the door as he went out. Mr. Crimsworth stirred the fire, then folded his arms, and sat a moment thinking, his lips compressed, his brow knit. I had nothing to do but watch him. How well his features were cut! What a handsome man he was! Whence, then, came the air of contraction, that narrow and hard aspect on his forehead, in all his lineaments. Turning to me, he began abruptly. You are come down to Shire to learn to be a tradesman? Yes, I am. Have you made up your mind on the point? Let me know that at once. Yes. Well, I am not bound to help you, but I have a place here vacant if you are qualified for it. I will take you on trial. What can you do? Do you know anything besides that useless trash of college learning? Greek, Latin and so forth. I have studied mathematics. Stuff, I dare say you have. I can read and write French and German. Hmm. He reflected a moment, then opening a drawer in a desk near him took out a letter and gave it to me. Can you read that? He asked. It was a German commercial letter. I translated it. I could not tell whether he was gratified or not. His countenance remained fixed. It is well, he said after a pause, that you are acquainted with something useful, something that may enable you to earn your board and lodging. Since you know French and German, I will take you as second clerk to manage the foreign correspondence of the house. I shall give you a good salary, ninety pounds a year. And now, he continued, raising his voice, hear once for all what I have to say about our relationship and all that sort of humbug. I must have no nonsense on that point, it would never suit me. I shall excuse you nothing on the plea of being my brother. If I find you stupid, negligent, dissipated, idle, or possessed of any faults detrimental to the interests of the house, I shall dismiss you as I would any other clerk. Ninety pounds a year are good wages, and I expect to have the full value of my money out of you. Remember, too, that things are on a practical footing in my establishment. Business-like habits, feelings and ideas suit me best. Do you understand? Partly, I replied. I suppose you mean that I am to do my work for my wages, not to expect favour from you, and not to depend on you for any help but what I earn. That suits me exactly, and on these terms I will consent to be your clerk. I turned on my heel and walked to the window. This time I did not consult his face to learn his opinion. What it was I do not know, nor did I then care. After a silence of some minutes he recommenced. You perhaps expect to be accommodated with apartments at Crimsworth Hall, and to go and come with me in the gig. I wish you, however, to be aware that such an arrangement would be quite inconvenient to me. I like to have the seat in my gig at liberty for any gentleman whom, for business reasons, I may wish to take down to the hall for a night or so. You will seek out lodgings in X. Quitting the window, I walked back to the hearth. Of course I shall seek out lodging in X. I answered. It would not suit me either to lodge at Crimsworth Hall. My tone was quiet. I always speak quiet. Yet Mr. Crimsworth's blue eyes became incensed. He took his revenge rather oddly. Turning to me, he said bluntly, You are poor enough, I suppose. How do you expect to live till your quarter's salary becomes due? I shall get on, said I. How do you expect to live? He repeated in a louder voice. As I can, Mr. Crimsworth. Get into debt at your peril, that's all, he answered. For aught I know, you may have extravagant aristocratic habits. If you have, drop them. I tolerate nothing of the sort here, and I will never give you a shilling extra, whatever liabilities you may incur. Mind that. Yes, Mr. Crimsworth, you will find I have a good memory.